Um, great. I was so, just taking advantage of a couple minutes of private chat time. <laughs> that's lovely. Yeah. Morning, uh, Pete. How are you today? It's so good to see you. I think you're muted. Yeah. It's good to see you, Judy. Charles, good morning. <laughs> Judy. Charles good is morning. Floating. Good morning. Good you. Yeah. Charles is floating in the universe. <laughs> you're working on something that homeschooling pods could learn from. They um, are. You were talking about that a few weeks ago. If you can yes. email that to me, I, I have a, two homeschooling pods. One, one grandson is in, they're both in two different homeschooling pods on the farm. I'd yeah, love we'd to. love to connect with you about that for sure, Kevin. Kevin, I wanted, I've, I'm sorry I haven't gotten back to you because I have a bunch of stuff that I do want to send you. But in particular, um, a rich area for science and related knowledge content is the professional mm. societies and specifically the American Chemical Society has a whole bunch of science K-12, all mm. done very effectively that they've put together a totally open resource for um, use in the pandemic by anyone, by parents, by teachers, et cetera. But it's, you know, it starts at the very simple levels of K-3, you know, with cartoons and representational concepts <clears throat> and moves up through high school science. So um, they've done a, I was pleasantly, proudly surprised that they had done all of this in rather quick order. <clears throat> but mm. I think I'm, I'm scouting around now because other professional societies are likely to have done the same. Mm -hmm. Triple AS. If you could send me uh, just a link to what you have or, or, that, or Yeah, or I'll whatever, send you a link to what I have. The, the other pieces that have been about. starting to tap into some, um, North American predominantly, but not entirely intergenerational learning exchange things in terms of mm. the, the role that the mentors are playing, the elders are playing as mentors to the children, especially during COVID and how they're redoing that because it has to be virtual instead of physical and security issues and all those other things. But both of those threads might be of use to you. Yeah, yeah. What they're finding in the pods is like, you know, there's a math mom and there's a social studies dad and they, one shows up at one time and one the other while they're still a teacher, uh, just because of what they care about. No, let's um, let's corral up so we can so we can get busy. Uh, Joe Cornelli had a really good idea on uh, our list, which was to ch to check in on the chat and basically, if you uh, would like to put in a couple lines about what's up for you in the chat, we can read through that. That would be really awesome. Um, And that's really interesting. So Kevin, your line is muted, but I'm hearing some typing, I think, from your line because it's highlighted. That was, that was probably me. Sorry. Oh, okay, it's probably you. That's interesting. Because Kevin, <laughs> Kevin's uh, little frame showed as yellow. I'm like, how's sound coming from Kevin? He's muted. It's impossible. I do think Neil is planning to come on, but he might be just a tad late. Cool, awesome. That's so, why he said he was planning to come. Uh, yeah, news overdose. I'm, I'm ready for tonight's debate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like primed and set and we are going to like make, pop, make don't, popcorn don't and make some go down drinks. the rabbit hole of politics but, right now. But you're going exactly. to watch a movie though, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're going to watch All the President's Men um, or Three Days of the Condor. I don't know. There's so many choices. Um, <clears throat> so um, so uh, yeah, a little discombobulated is, is right because like the world is a little crazy. Uh, so I, I created a Google Doc for us to um, use. Well, I just lost my, which of these many windows is my Zoom? There we go. Uh, I created a Google Doc for us to um, share answers in. And I may have the wrong questions in the Google Doc, but if you want to click on there, uh, anybody with the link should have edit privileges. Um, so everybody can go writing in. And what I was thinking was, as we talk, we could flesh out uh, questions on here. I'm not sure I have the right questions, but, um, but I thought this would be a really good way for us to focus our efforts a bit and get a lot of things done quickly in parallel as we have discussion. Um, and so let me just walk through the questions that I set up. And I don't know that we can get through all of them in an hour because I'd like to wrap at the top of the hour. Uh, but I, I said, what is the best thing you can imagine that OGM creates or does or pulls off? Like, what, like just free your mind. You've been in some conversations, you've been online, you've been in different places. Some of this has been turning. I think a lot of us have, think it's, you know, think OGM is a, like a rope or like a wall or like, a, like a, a vat of lard or something. 
we, we, each, we have sort of different conceptions of what it is we're working on, but what is the best thing we could pull off in, in your mind? Uh, second question, what organizations are role models or benchmarks? What, what, who should we be like? Like who can we crib good ideas from? And this could, could end up being a really long list. I have a huge list of potential uh, OGM sort of, uh, I call them neighbor communities, uh, which I'll share in uh, as a link on when I answer that question. But, but, like, like, but, but in particular, in particular, is an organization that's tr that's got aims kind of like ours, or in some meta in some way sort of like ours, that we might learn a whole lot from, borrow business models, etc. Uh, yeah, exactly. It'd be strategic allies. Um, third, how would you describe OGM's business model? Because uh, at one level, this is a fun party where we're volunteering our time and doing something we think is worthwhile. Uh, that's likely not. That's sustainable. Although there, there are plenty of communities that have no business model that go on for years and years and years that are really fruitful. So that could happen. Um, I think many of us have a feeling like there could be there could be ways of making this sustainable, and in particular of, of having people make a living um, as they participate in OGM in different ways and of fueling OGM's creation of parts that are missing, et cetera. So what would that be? Um, Number four is how might we best relate with other organizations? It is a dream of mine that we approach some of these neighbor communities and say, hey, um, how do we build a bridge? How might we help you? How do you, how, how do you build, how do you become a part of what we're busy creating? Like, what does that look like? How do we go about doing that? Um, is that important? Number five, I put how might we organize ourselves to meet most of our various goals? Uh, by which I mean a bunch of us are here with different ideas about why we're here and also um, either specific interests in whether it be education or food science and the food system or systems thinking or whatever else or um, very different uh, very different desires to cope with ambiguity and uncertainty versus uh, here's a task I can go do let's go do it kind of thing so how do we how do we organize ourselves to, to meet some of those things and then uh, uh, the last question is maybe more obvious for any kind of group like this, which part of this would you be interested in leading or participating in? Um, and so I, I just went through the list of questions to just bre breach them right away with you. And have I missed a big important, does this sort of cover what you thought we would be talking about here? And if not, uh, can you type in the chat uh, a question that you would propose we, uh, we throw in there? And if so, give it a number. So, you know, this is more important than number two. This is like, like uh, if, if there's a question I'm really missing among these, this, this uh, quick list, uh, what, what is it and where would you order it? Um, maybe I'm missing it, but I'll, I can write it in also. But for number three, describing OGM's business model, we still didn't really define OGM. So, or is that actually what we're doing? I think that's what we're doing through this process, but maybe there needs to be a more explicit question of how would you define OGM or what is OGM's elevator pitch or what is our, like, do we maybe. need, do we need that as a question as well? I didn't put that in. There's a dimension, I think, Jerry, that would be, um, there's two dimensions of business model. One dimension is the economic one, um, and that's a particular one that we should cover for sure because I think I view that in, in a way as how do we, I'm thinking super big, but I'm like, I'd like OGM to be a global foundation and to, to get to that such that we have those monies and resources and endowments and so forth to keep this going in a perpetual, perpetual way. We have to frame a lot of different dimensions and then decide how we source that funding. Um, but it, there's another dimension of it, which is how would, what, what, are our, what are our outputs that are of value to people? Um, because that's what that's how we build that mass of collective information and shared work and so forth. Does that cool. help at all? Um, I think it does. Um, anyone else want to frame that or, and, and add it in, fold that into the questions we have? I think I think this. I, this I, I, go, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I, when I start something, I, I use a phrase by Frederick Beekner that has been useful to me, and he says, "Where does your uh, greatest passion meet with the world's greatest need?" Mm -hmm. and then I build something there. Um, this is a little bit like the Ikigai Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. Hey, Neil. Um, Hi, everybody. Sorry I'm late. I was on another call. Uh, got dragged 
dragged back at it later than intended. So that is okay. I'm I'm resharing a link to a Google Doc that I created, which has a bunch of questions in it, which I just read through. Um, the question now in front of the group is what other what questions that I did I miss? And I don't think we're going to get through all these in an hour. But if we sort of run in parallel, we could get an awful lot done, uh, skipping around through it. Um, I I would like to see a question, and I'm not. I, so I, I I have to brainstorm the question even. Yep. Um, but it's about um, uh, who participates in OGM. Um, uh, how how do we encourage diversity um and also um uh how do we have a membrane uh, what what activities would get you kicked out of ogm maybe or something mm. like that mm -hmm. Um, so thresholds for participation of different kinds like how do we how do we improve and increase participation and diversity how do we understand I may be imply, inferring from that a question about other kind of membership types in, in terms of somebody's just the lurker and passing through. Maybe that's too much detail, uh, but also how do we know when somebody has stepped out of bounds of behavior for the community and we need to take action? Does that makes sense? Yeah, and, and for that last one, I, I didn't really, in, in, uh, I didn't have types inferred in there, although it's an interesting thing to, I think that's an interesting thing to observe, maybe it, not necessarily. It came up early in my discussions with Matt and, and Hank and, and Ham. We were like, well, you know, yeah. there, there, there's likely to be a need for some kind of roles or types or something, something I, like I that. I think that's really useful. For kind the of, um, getting yourself kicked out, thing is, yeah. is I, that's not well expressed, Jerry expressed it better, but I think I wouldn't make a, a laundry list of how that happens, but rather um, a meta level above that, um, how our conflicts resolves um, and how do we, how do we create, you know, um, better participation and, and encourage people to either, you know, show up or, or leave. And um, that brings up two really interesting things. I'll go to you, Charles, in just a second. Um, two interesting things, which is, should we have a code of conduct? Very likely, yes. Uh, and how do we go about conflict resolution, which I see as one of the core competencies eventually of OGM, just from my own perspective, is that a piece of this is about how, coming together into uh, uh, some, sort of, some forms of consensus, some forms of community, some forms of collaborative making of things. And to do that, we're going to have to figure out conflict resolution. So I think that's going to play a really, uh, a pretty big role. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> well, since you mentioned conflict resolution, just, just to say we, we did some deep diving on Monday in the Kiko lab. Um, so we're, we're sort of, it's very alive as a topic um, these couple of weeks with us. And so we can, we can for sure um, synergize around that. But what I wanted to say was um, in regard to what Pete was sharing about um, diversity and kind of going back before that, it's even in the name Open Global Mind, right? Open Global Mind. And then the, the onboarding aspect, I want to sort of highlight somehow. And it's, um, it's not 100% open in that you have to accept people to come into the, um, the email list for example, or I guess with the discourse probably as well. So, um, and that kind of sent a flag up with a few people that I wanted to invite in the beginning. I, I don't know who it was who commented, you know, oh, it's open, but it's not open. But I mean, that's, I'm fine with all that. That's the easy stuff. But um, just to be aware of these things as they resonate in the brand itself, it's open and yet, you know, the membrane, like, like how permeable mm -hmm. is the membrane on the, at, the, at, the, at the outset, on the onboarding. So I like that. Uh, and I'm adding, I'm, I'm just going to add a question at the end. Um, how would you explain or define OGM? Uh, it's a huge, it's a big question, but I think that, I think that defining OGM is, is going to, is going to slake some of the hunger we have for, for figuring out what we're doing here. So I just added that at the end. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, so Kevin wrote, this group is trying to create meaning using tech and structured data mapped on complexity. That's a tech male white guy method of pursuing truth, mostly. Diversity is an afterthought. The method is culturally exclusive and that is not really changeable. So a couple thoughts. Um, just a really quick answer, Kevin, and, and you've raised your hand. So did, we, did you raise your hand about this statement on the chat or something else? Yeah, I did. And uh, yes, and I can come up with a, with, a, with a similar situation analogy, if that'll be helpful at this moment. 
Um, if you want to build on that, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah, so I was <clears throat> with a group of progressive Christians uh, a couple of years ago, and there was one black woman in the room, and, and the leader, uh, white guy, said, I'm really mourning our lack of diversity. And the black woman said, look, you're all progressive Christians, and you're dealing with the legacy of a fundamentalist gra grandmother. Black folks don't have that. You're dealing with your issue, and uh, I'm here as an ambassador to report back. So you're not going to get any more. Uh, that's who you are, and that's what it is. And so, you know, my wife went on to create an event where we looked at mass incarceration and voter suppression. We had 40% African American participation. But if you're dealing with white guy issues, or if you're dealing with the white guy method of truth, then that's the room will look like this room. Um, totally agree. And a couple things. At the beginning, I was trying really hard to improve diversity by challenging everybody who's in my demographic to invite other people who are not to these conversations. That has failed. Uh, we are definitely working on issues that are, uh, if you're BIPOC, uh, you are not that focused on do we have a memory? How do we, you know, how do we have better dialogue and discourse? There's, there's extremely like, there's hot burning fires on the ground right now that you need to either put out or, or change. Um, and so, and, and also third thought is um, a bunch of the stuff on, in OGM is very geeky and is about visualization and storytelling and so forth. But there's, a, there's like one of the basic thoughts I was trying to put into OGM was that emotion and membership trump logic or reason most of the time. And how do we bridge the cultural divide? How do we create, and, and there's a whole bunch of facilitation, presencing, vulnerability, a dialogue discourse stuff that has nothing to do with technology that's meant to be in this container as well that we haven't represented that that much that well um, but that is very much about about the the kinds of things that you're talking about kevin so i think i think we're operating at a deficit here but that's not the intention and i think maybe one of our questions should <clears throat> should model this should say how do we how do we prevent being something that's just for us um, my hope in one of those questions about bridging or connecting to other organizations is that we can meld into the world of diverse efforts and organizations by being helpful to them. Judy. Well, just to, to play off your first comment in terms of the different types of diversity, I haven't given up on this being really broadly inclusive, not just the people that were, are in the room right now. I think that that will happen as we develop a dissemination process, as we figure out how to run hundreds of little experiments in different communities for different purposes, those people will become part of the whole. I think that we can be more concerted perhaps about trying to get some people into the workshop and into subsequent workshops, which I think is how we ought to view the workshops. I think we should keep the very first workshop framed very high level and basically try to answer the questions that you've got here so that we come around to a good perspective and then gradually wade deeper into executional dimensions, tangents, directions, subgroups, and subsets. But I think it, I don't, I don't believe that it needs to remain as exclusive, if you will, as it is right now. And it's just that you have to have the right hook and purpose to persuade other passionate people that this warrants the time on their full calendar, the things they're already doing with a lot of energy. Yes, Neil, and then Charles. Yeah, um, thanks everybody. Thanks Judith for that. One of the challenges that I've had in the past, and I think it applies here, is uh, do, you do you include before you all try and move forward, or do you transcend to then include? And my, my suggestion is that the, we need some vertical differentiation as well as horizontal differentiation. There's a need for people that can handle emergent complexity, bigger realities than their current worldviews might actually allow them to, to be grokking at. However, if done with system ethics in mind, on behalf of all, with good intentions, and if stated as these are the intentions, that we will be inclusive, that we will, we're not being judged now. We're trying to create a system that will enable it to be done in the future. And I think my sense is this is a similar thing that has to be considered for OGM. That OGM is a potentially very powerful tool but at what level is it going to operate, right? And if it's going to operate here, it's not going to appeal to these people. It's going to operate here, it's not going to appeal to these people. With some vertical integration, it can appeal to all those people because it's different levels of narrative, different levels of meaning, different levels of whatever. So my sense is that the 
the experiments aren't just spatially distributed on a plane. They're potentially different levels of experiment. And how do we ha hold the space to address trauma? Uh, collective trauma around money, around power, around status, around race, around, right? How do we hold space for specific targeted interventions in a small community? And how do we sense into that? So there's gonna be different roles at different levels that can be applied. And one of the issues, Judy and I had a conversation yesterday, one of the issues that came up for me was, um, in terms of who's in and who's out, Pete was sort of talking about who's in, who's out. There's a big cut here on income versus outcome. And there's gonna be a big division over who's in it for the money and who's in it for the benefit, right? And they don't have to be separate. But if they aren't integrated, we've got a problem because there's gonna be competing slash conflicting interests. And this is coming up in other groups as well. And one of the traumas we have to address is that around money um, and those that do have it, those that don't have it, those that can survive without it, those that still need lots. But if, if the whole of the energy is being subverted towards somebody's private funding scheme, as opposed to everybody's collective benefit, then we're gonna have be at odds in terms of how we move forward. So my suggestion would be some sort of system ethical meta constitution process. These are the rules that we have agreed at the start for how we will agree the rules. And within these rules, we're now doing our best to develop the system to make this work. And OGM can be a tool in helping us to do that as well. And in the brain cancer work I was involved with, things like we, the people undersigned, recognize these as universal harms. Brain cancer can affect anybody. D -d 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 -d. You know, these are the medications. We need to investigate alternative technologies and medicines, etc. And because we believe that, this is how we will act. And so in this case, summing up what I've heard in multiple conversations, because we recognize the need for diversity, because we recognize Earth's in, in a shitty mess, because we realize we've got uh, some agency in what we do about this, because we can come together as a group, this is how we will operate. And with something like that, you can then say, and now how do we answer these questions? But I'd take it to the high level and come down to transcend, to then include, rather than say, let's get everybody on the conversation and try and decide how high to go, because it's gonna be lowest common denominator. So that's just my, my sense. Thank you. Um, and I, I think we'll, we'll circle back to this as we touch the questions and as we go back into it. Um, Charles, did I get you? Go ahead, Charles. I, I, and then I, I, Bill, did you have your hand up? Okay, so Charles and Bill. Something quick, um, just Judy, uh, Judy and Neil um, probably covered most of, of what we um, want perhaps in, in the invitation, in, in the kind of, uh, you know, Judy used the word hook, what's the hook? Um, and, I, and then I thought about, you know, I mean, to use a crass term, marketing, you know, what's the, what's the description basically of, for the invitation, for the, for, for the onboarding, back to the onboarding theme. Um, and actually it was really rich what was just uh, recorded, thankfully, and, and transcribed. And, and so um, I think we can basically lift it wholesale largely and edit it a, a little bit from the transcript and we're, we'd be pretty good. Over. Sounds great. Thanks. Bill? I feel like there's two related meta problems going on here over the last few months. I, uh, I, I sort of stopped coming to calls for a while. Um, and I'm impatient. Um, and I, and it seems crazy to me that this organization, which is not an organization, is what I would call in the wanking phase, six months after creation. Um, and I feel like a lot of the discussion about process and roles and all sorts of stuff is really hard to do in a vacuum and it's all cart before the horse kind of thing. And I think it's, I think what we need is to have a process that leads to some forward energy that makes change of some kind, whether that is whatever it is. A and I feel related to that, that this group was started by essentially a core group of people who probably have a lot of alignment of what they envision. You and some of the consultant type folks, it felt like there were like three people that were sort of like a core nub of this group. And I think you should just stand up and take some fucking ownership. Um, 
and, and sort of push things forward and then see if you get pushed back, but to essentially use positive directed energy in a specific way to say, even if it's about like having a workshop that's focused on, you know, a belief of mechanisms towards progress and hey, three of us think that if we make these things and if this happens and then these other things happen, that that will help this big thing happen, which is about something real and let people then maybe argue with that process or whatever. But I feel like there has to be some nuggets of action that affects the outside world. And I, th I think that solves or it leads to solution of all the meta stuff that we get wrapped up in. Because I think like the discussion about who wants to be involved? Well, what is there to be involved in? Like we've got a discussion board that's discussions, mm -hmm. but does the world really need another one of those? I don't think so. So right. I feel like, you know, everybody's looking for direction kind of thing. And, and, and I just feel like, you know, it has to come, this is where my whole bias towards action comes in. And I feel like in the absence of that, despite all the discussions of codes of conduct, any group without external feedback from the real world is bound to become pathological. And so the, the urgency, the first order of business is some sort of process that very quickly creates some definition of the intent for forward action and interaction with the outside world in a meaningful way, which is not just discussing with other groups, but again, what does that lead to? And, and just sort of like knock it down and I'm going on too far and sort of circling back, but, but I feel like even this last 15 minutes has been all talking about the wrong thing. So let's, I'd like to pause for 30 seconds so we can absorb what Bill just said. Then I'd like to answer briefly, then Judy, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Uh, Bill, thank you for what you said a lot. Um, and I, I this, despite everything my track record would show, I have a bias for action too. I just love getting shit done that matters, that pushes on something, that tips something over, that helps somebody. That's like, I'm all in on that. Um, and uh, you're right, this thing exists because uh, Peter Van introduced me to Hamilton from Connective Next who introduced me to Matt. Matt and I had a, a couple conversations where this thing just sort of took off. The four of us, just three Connective Next guys and me, started meeting regularly to talk about this. And then we're like, ah, this could be bigger. And then we opened it up and started inviting people in. I said, why don't we just turn uh, the Thursday morning calls, which, which we were having just the four of us, into an open thing, and that turns into this. In the meantime, Hamilton, who does BizDev for Connective Next, Ham and, and Matt, who, who, who founded it, um, have pitched at least three different projects that would have been OGME projects that would have employed OGM people all three of which have bonked, like none of these has actually landed. And they would have been like, one of them would have been huge with a, with a company everybody would recognize that would be super interesting, that would not only probably employ a few people in this community, but also feed the commons, meaning they might actually fund a pool. Part of my, my, my notion here is to create a reservoir of funds with which we can fund some fellows, just for lack of a better word, um, who could then not worry about the rent and, 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 you know, getting food and contribute to what this is. So if any of those had landed, we would have had something, I think, that would have met your criteria really, really well, Bill. I had a conversation, I had a, small, a short uh, sort of consulting session this Monday with a group that's working with uh, a transnational uh, nonprofit that everybody would recognize that got really interested and they loved my brain and I pitched, I've sort of talked a lot about OGM. And if that turns into something larger, that'll turn into a completely concrete thing that in fact has to do with global development that I think would appeal to a whole ton of us in different ways. And so, so kind of behind the scenes, as we're sitting here wanking, um, 
uh, I think behind the scenes, we're sort of like trying to, to, to f catch a boar and put the boar on the table and say, okay, we got a boar, we got a boar. Let, like, let's do something with the boar. But we're not saying enough about that in the group. And, um, and then also we have a bunch of really, really brilliant systems thinkers who would like to create the framework that works for, for this whole thing. Um, and then we have also attracted a bunch of like, this smells really good, but I just wanna go do something right now. And we're not creating enough things that we can do right now. And I'll just finish by saying, and one thing we could do right now is be of service to diverse communities that really could use some help, which would increase our diversity while building something we need, while feeding our souls for this, this need, need for action. So I'm, I'm thinking that that might be a really good thing to try to do early, is to try to be of service to others. Joe, welcome to the call. Uh, Judy, over to you. And for Romer and Joe, I don't know if you saw the link to the Google Doc that I put earlier, so I'm gonna paste it again in the chat. Uh, Judy, it's your, your floor. Well, I just <clears throat> wanted to say, Bill, that I, I share your passion for action and the folks who've been listening during the meandering of a couple months have been hearing me constantly say, when are we going to do an experiment? When are we going to try something? Because that's where we get the feedback. I think that that dynamic tension between the thought process and the execution is part of what we're framing here today. So your comments are very much spot on. And I agree with Jerry that the process of doing that will tell us to what extent the types of things we're creating are useful and, and how to help civilization. And I use that in the biggest sense because I think we're looking this is a room full of big thinkers who want to try to figure out how to fix big problems in an effective way. And that means not starting at the top of some hierarchical system that may not be the right process at all, but getting the infrastructure in place for continuous learning in a lot of different settings. And so I think there's an important truth in what you said, Bill, about this tension between the ideation and the execution and I just want to support that as something that we build in very early because I think that that's what's going to help us frame a concept that becomes useful, which then allows a lot of value to derive to either contributors or to a, an infrastructure of a foundation or something that would enable the continuation of this that then deals with a lot of the nitty gritty of how you dispense necessary monies as needed. Uh, Neil, and then others who have thoughts about what Bill said. Yeah, just added to that. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Judith. Um, this is exactly the example I'm talking about in terms of vertical differentiation, um, because we are doing work here right now. The, you know, the question is, when you get a pro when you get a project, how do you decide that that is your priority? So, in triple loop learning, you learn, you know, am I doing the right things? Right. Secondly, am I sorry? Firstly, am I doing things right? Second, am I doing the right things? Third, how do I decide the right things? And the existential loop is how do I decide the right things? With a tool and with this collective of, of powerful players, how do we decide the right things? So there's, to me, there's an opportunity here for a project to include the framing, not just the getting of the money, right? If there's a project on the table, how do we demonstrate we can actually do it? And which is where I presume that the, the you know, checking out by Collective Next and others to try and find projects would demonstrate by example what we're capable of. But I imagine of the whole set of uh, projects that might come on the table, we should also have some criteria for how we decide whether or not we ought to help them, which is an ethical question. Is this the biggest priority for me right now? So if somebody came along today and said, all the energy of OGM is going to go into this little tiny project, which I don't see any value of, I'd be saying, well, what am I here for? So I think there's a need for a vertical differentiation and for a mechanism for how we compensate those who are creating the space and the envelope for those projects to be born in, as well as for those who find the projects and get the money from them. And this is a commons based, peer to peer based. How do we, what are the principles we hold true to enable the birthing of what wants to be born in these difficult, dangerous, critical times? So that's what I'm looking for. How do we get the highest possible outcome, not just the highest possible income? And if we can get some connection between those two and mutual recognition and reciprocity between those doing and creating the space for it, then I think we've got somewhere. Uh, however, when I pose the big questions in discourse, I got very limited uh, interaction. When we pose the small questions, there's very limited interaction because we don't have a nucleus yet we can hang 
all of us on. So let's define multiple planes at which we can operate and be mutually respectful of different planes we're operating on. And unfortunately, in my experience, most of the time, the people that can win the money and do the projects are held up as the heroes and the ones that create the space for that more conscious, aware systems thinkers creating the space for new markets, whether it be innovators, whatever, get screwed in the process. So you need some sort of reciprocal mechanism for feeding the center, which is I think what you were talking about, Jerry. How do we get something to come back from whatever is being earned in a way that supports those capable of going further, faster to do so on behalf of those that will come through and implement the projects. And I think we can hold all of that because we have the capacity. Um, whether or not we choose to do that is up to its group. Yeah, and, and I have a feeling that there's a spirit of let's address some of those ethical issues and, and structural principled issues as they arise as we start doing stuff in the world. So somebody's going to propose, let's, let's make a better form of, of nitroglycerin. And it'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, like let, now let's pin that on the larger board of why we do and don't do certain different kinds of things. So, so basically, how might, so I think that there's a few people who are deeply interested in building the larger, the larger ethical framework and, and sort of structural framework. And, and, and they should be in that vertical part of the stack and go, go um, like flesh that out and bring it back. And we should reward them for that effort. Um, uh, but there's a, a, a bunch of people who are like, can we just put those, those puzzle pieces on, into that puzzle as we hit the puzzle pieces by doing stuff on the ground, right? Um, and, I, and I think that will actually inform a lot of what we're trying to do. And then uh, briefly before I go to Judy again, um, I put in the chat sort of syncretism and having a, a smart membrane, by which I meant, this is part of my answer to how do we relate to other groups. There are a whole bunch of really interesting groups out there doing fabulous work, whether it's uh, Theory U or what have you. They're, they're, I, I collect them, there's hundreds of them. I'm really interested in us being sort of syncretistic. I'm not even sure how you conjugate that, but basically absorbent to different kinds of process without becoming a holacracy shop ourselves, but, but being useful to them, permeable to them, taking the best of what they do and integrating it into our framework of how we work and then being contagious, meaning if we do this right, we wind up being a very inclusive, contagious process that can infect organizations to start thinking differently about their commons, thinking differently about the principles of how they operate. And, and like we can become an actual functional organization, which we're far from being at this point, um, that is modeling the kinds of behaviors we'd like to do as it designs the new memory, the new shared memory, as it does, as it does other kinds of things. So Judy, then Doug. So I was just going to say that I love the discussion, but I don't want to get buried in it. The, the dim dimensions between the um, gestation and ideation and the execution are, are cyclical. And so I don't know that people stay in one place, even if you think of the organization in different tiers of function and, and roles, because the people who have an idea will want to pursue the idea and the people who are doing the idea will want to feed it back into the thought process. And so I think we're talking something that's really dynamic and that's part of our construct that we want to capture as we define how we want to operate. Yep, thank you. Doug? Oh, you're muted. As always. <laughs> okay. Uh, to me, what characterizes this group is heart. It's people who have a lot of feeling. And I think when it comes to logic, we're not so terrific. Uh, when it comes to political process, maybe we're not so terrific in comparison to heart. And here's a group that's kind of been extruded from the Silicon Valley culture with a lot of understanding about technology. And it seems to me that the heart question is what the world needs in a lot of places. And what we should be thinking about is how to introduce our heart back into the technology world and uh, create a, a, a deeper sense of humanity. So that's Excellent. my first and, thought. And so that would go under, and I'd like to turn our attention to the Google Doc so we can actually sort of riff on it while we're here because we have 20 more minutes. Um, that would go under like what is one of the best things that we could do with OGM? That'd be a fabulous answer there. And Doug, did you see the link to the Google Doc? Are you in there? Okay, good. No, so, I'm not in there yet, but I see it. Okay, and, and I, what I wanted to do was was collect up exactly the kind of, of response you just gave in that shared doc so we can share that back to the larger OGM group and move this conversation forward. Judy. No, I didn't have my hand up. 
I, I had, so I was just curious, um, I mean, I, I wish Matt was here, but because I think he's going to be leading the workshop, um, but I guess he couldn't be or, and, and given the short time today on the call, maybe we can, or maybe that's really the document is, is just exactly for the workshop, but we didn't really talk about this uh, workshop in a couple of weeks and maybe that's something we could do. So let me do that. Um, so I mentioned in the email invite to this call that Matt, the last call uh, kept going. So I, I had to get off the call and then Pete pinged me and said, hey, we're still talking. And the, the call actually lasted three hours. Um, and I jumped back in toward the end. And what happened was Matt was proposing, hey, let's actually just like try to sort these things out together and let's run a workshop. So uh, Matt and his team are now designing a five hour workshop on the 29th. And we're trying to figure out sort of the marching, the, the, the structure for it and, and, and so forth uh, that would let us sit down and, and talk through some of these kinds of issues. The reason I created this call was um, in order, the first step of, of the, the workshop they're thinking about is having everybody sort of individually work on designs for OGM. I'm like, we haven't turned the soil enough together actively to figure out, like to have unison, to have a sense of resonance on what that is. So I figured I would create a small sequence of calls just like this and make them short and sharp and record them and put them out so that anybody could watch them later in, in the whole group. But let's, let's start creating some resonance by beating on this thing together uh, in a little bit rhythmic way. So there'll be more of these calls. And the reason that nobody from Collective Next is on here is that I just sent the invite yesterday and they've all got work to do. So uh, they weren't able to fit this in, the, in their schedule. Um, so th that's the goal. And I, and I wanna have more of these kinds of calls. So I'll set a couple up for next week. Uh, where we can come back to this. And hopefully the Google Doc that I shared becomes a persistent document across these conversations and feeds into the process and whatever else we do does as, as well, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Just just to, to respond briefly, um, for, first of all, next week I'll have my, my kids all week on the holiday. So I'll probably get to chime in, but not consistently or reliably, unfortunately. But I look forward to the recordings. Um, and then in terms of this workshop design, is that necessarily in a kind of black box or, or can, if some of us are called and have time to co-create, is that appropriate to, to even ask? I mean, it's sort of, you know. I think open. it's totally appropriate to ask. I think ping, uh, <laughs> ping, Matt, ping Matt and Hank and uh, uh, okay. just say, just say we'd love to help design the workshop. They'll, they'll be like totally up for that. <clears throat> um, and Romer, you, you sort of asked the question that triggered this event happening. I'd love to just give you the floor and, and let you roam on um, how, you think about, how you think about this and what you wish would happen. Uh, you are still muted. There we go. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, sorry, I, I'm using my iPhone here. Uh, well, uh, um, thank you for this opportunity, Jerry, and I really appreciate the, you know, the time to be able to uh, express myself here as a newbie. And uh, I'm echoing uh, Doug's uh, statement here in terms of uh, the heart. And uh, I'm also echoing uh, some of uh, your comments here in terms of uh, a certain level of alignment. And I guess from my uh, uh, point of view, uh, what am I missing is where do I align in terms of values of uh, 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 that uh, we are looking at for OGM? And I, I think this is very important to uh, define collectively the vision and the values so that, you know, in every step of the way, whenever we have certain level of dissonance or disagreement, we have this uh, 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 defined uh, centering we have this ability to center ourselves on what is really important uh, for all of us and uh, uh, from my end point in terms of actions it's without a clear view of the vision and the values that i'm going to be adhering into it's going to be very hard for me to uh, uh, to really provide further actions because of the fact that there's not much clarity. So uh, moving forward, I really look forward to um, gaining more clarity in terms of what are these three things? What are our visions? What are our values? And how do we um, 
work together in order to make things happen. So uh, that's just my uh, few cents here. And thank you. No, well, thank you. And having some clarity on that would be super useful. And uh, I think we're kind of on that road. Joe. Uh, could I maybe propose an even more sharp uh, version of that, which is um, something that I, I want to share just as a kind of newcomer uh, to this group, well, quite a newcomer to this group. Um, I found that uh, there's a real difference, let's say, between values and opinions. And I think we should be really careful if we sharpen up and clarify what the values are to also explain the relationship to opinions, because um, I find it kind of difficult if I see people sharing things that they they that is their opinion, uh, but they're sharing it in a way that that requires my buy-in to that opinion, and I, and I just don't have that. That doesn't mean that I might not share values with that person, um, but I think that those that level of hierarchy is really important. And so I, I I fear that as a result I've come across as a very contrarian and negative person because I try to shoot down every opinion that I see. Um, but that's not because I, I don't share some of the values. Um, so I, I think that for me, open global mind might be something where you actually have this values uh, quite clarified, but maybe takes a somewhat def deflationary attitude towards opinions. But that's just an opinion. That's just a possible opinion. So I, I don't know. I don't know how that shakes up, but I just wanted to raise that other level of the hierarchy. So, so Joe, you've raised a really great question, and I'm clearly expressing an opinion here. Um, and I would love it if there were people with very opposing opinions in this group. And diversity also means diversity of point of view. And one of the really important goals of OGM in my head <clears throat> is how to bridge the cultural divide, how to actually have reasonable conversations around very difficult issues that are splitting the whole world apart. That, that to me is <clears throat> top dead center for what OGM could achieve if we do this right. We could, we could sort of pierce that. Could you elaborate a little bit more just with an example or with whatever about what you mean by differentiating between values and opinions? So, I think I follow you, but I'd love to see yeah, how this lives in your well, life. Why don't, why, yeah, sure. Why don't I then make it an example about me just to say like, you know, maybe 20 years ago, I was very idealistic about free software. I thought free software and open source was the way to go. Now here I am, I'm 40, I'm here on a Zoom call. Granted, I've got Zoom running on my Ubuntu, but I, I, I'm very open-minded about look, let's use the current technologies. Let's, uh, it's not about free software versus the rest of the world. It's about being pragmatic and getting things done. So um, I would say that, that uh, my, I, I would spike opinions. I would say, do we really need to have, be using free software for everything? No, even Richard Stallman would agree with that actually. So, um, so let's spike this opinion that free software is the only way to go, however, let's look at the values that free software brings to us and why open sharing copyleft what the what the what the things that those contribute are and those are harder questions than just saying this is better or this is right those are interesting questions and so those questions would then be worthy i think of elaboration but those aren't going to be one those aren't debates those are discussions so killing off the debates and uh, enlivening the discussions would be how it might play out. Thank you. And, and it's funny, you're reminding me, I, yesterday I had a call, I hadn't talked to this guy for three, four or five months, maybe through all of lockdown. His name is Rome Viharo, and he has a method for, uh, he has a kind of an algorithm that helps create consensus among people with di 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 you know, differing opinions. And it's quite or ornate and his, his framing for it is, is like confusing, but there's a pony there and I know there's a pony there. And it's like, how do I, how do we host how do we host him improving his project in the middle of this? Because it would help create what you're, I think, looking for in some way. It would be a component of, of a solution like that. Uh, Charles. Um, maybe I'm just kind of uh, skimming in my listening, but um, in all this kind of talk about values and conversation and, and like we, we have conversation down. I think aside from heart, we, we, we for sure, you know, we all have a lot of conversations. Um, anyway, I do. But uh, how to bridge that into the action, I think, and that maybe points back to to um, some of the tech solutions and, and, and other things. Um, I think I just wanted to underscore, you know, all the talk is great, but but yeah, we, we have stuff to do. And, and so how to actually, you know, get get from the talking to the doing. That's that, the, What's the actual bridge in detail? I think a question that I didn't ask on the doc is what does what would what would satisfactory doing look like to you? Like what is a project you would like to see OGM achieve? That's a question that actually should be number two, probably or number one. Um, 
uh, because, because I could, I could. There's, there's, go ahead. there's a whole bunch of us who really care about that and that's not explicit in, in the document. And, and if we know what six people think doing looks like, then we can say, who wants to join this person to go do that thing? And then, and then anybody who's doing anything related to OGM, here's how to report back to us. Here's how to, here's how to maintain status. Here's how to keep visibility with us, which becomes a part of our marching orders into the different vertical parts of the stack that Neil's talking about, which feeds the process, which so on and so forth. Uh, Charles, then Judy. So just to finish off, because actually I can wrap wrap this up in a nice little bundle pointing to Joe Cornelli and the pedagogy folks in the rap um, pattern, um, which um, Lauren and I sort of aspire to doing it more intentionally and with more focus. But I think it really points to the knowledge repository in whatever forms, whatever we want to call it. And that's a two in one for me. That's a project I'm, I'm riveted to get involved in or be, be more involved in. Um, and that's also the bridge, actually, that I'm, I, I think that's really the heart of, of where the conversation meets the road. So let's put that in the document. And uh, Joe, if you want to talk a little about the, about the knowledge repository, and, and also, and I'll come back to you after Judy, uh, but I'll also add that the Pyragogy Handbook, I, I met Howard Rheingold when I was writing for Esther Dyson, and I wrote about online community, and he was just publishing his book, Virtual Community. And I had seen him on the well because I was the well was one of my early places online, and we sort of uh, met and I wrote about it. I quoted him I think in the first paragraph of the issues that I wrote, and have been following him ever since. And all of the stuff that's and I've been a guest in his classroom at Berkeley and stuff like that. But all of the stuff that's come out of Pyragogy, I'm just dying to instrument, implement, liberate, make useful in the world. I think that would be a phenomenal thing, and I think that would be a, a tremendously congruent project between what Pyragogy seems to be seems to be trying to do because I haven't been in those conversations, and what I think we're trying to do. Um, does that, just, is that a, go ahead, go ahead, Charles. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but just a t breaking news that Howard actually confirmed to, to join Kiko Lab on the 19th of October, that's a Monday, uh, two Mondays from now, and that will be um, kind of two subjects, one on the early co-learning, co um, a bit of an of a overview, um, and then kind of dovetailing into crap detection, but first kind of looking at what does it mean for crap detection for kids these days, and then going into more of a, like leading up to the election crap detection type stuff. So Howard Rheingold, Kiko Lab, Monday the 19th of October. And you'll put the invitation on the OGM list, I assume. Um, and Joe, does that smell right? And if not, in what way doesn't it? And then over to Judy. Well, I guess we covered quite a lot in that as like a paragraph or something, but um, yeah, I put, let me put what I just read out what I said here in the in item six on the Google Doc, I just said that um, you know my skills are such that I have a PhD in something called knowledge media, so I could take on a role a bit like technologist, digital librarian, and Charles and I have talked about what would look like to reboot the whole Earth catalog. I think that's what we talked about. I can't remember. We we were talking about um, uh, maybe we were talking about the uh, co-evolutionary quarterly, but you know that they're they're related documents. I should I should re. re rewind that. So what would it look like? And, and yeah, Howard was involved with the latest, I think, uh, edition of the Whole Earth Catalog. So we could definitely pick his brain about how to make a contemporary Whole Earth Catalog. Um, and that would be an example of this kind of knowledge repository. So yes, that's something I could contribute to. And, and we've talked about it um, in terms of how, yeah, so Pure Gaji releases everything under the CC0 license, which is the most open license. Uh, that's not enough. What we also try to do is like, help people find ways in and teach and share knowledge about how to engage with uh, material reality. Um, so just licensing is not enough. Uh, we have a bit of a roadmap ahead, both through version four and version five of the Pyragogy Handbook. Um, so I can share those. I think I've put them on, online to some extent. Those are still developing. So, so for anyone who wants to get involved with version four, that's work in progress and version five is right now a vision. Um, but yeah, those things can be discussed. With Fortune, version five lives in OGM like land of some sort. And we, we can be like, that can be a, a thing that we can help build. Cool, yeah. Um, Judy. I was just thinking that, that one, of, one of the options would be to have a space within our context where people just put in what they're working on. And we don't spend so much time on check on and what they're working on, but it becomes a repository of active projects and others can look at that and say, oh, I should call Joe, I'd like to work with him on this, or I could call Neil and I'd work with him on that. So my in process rework of the OGM website, which I've just sort of stalled on, 
has a Google Doc with different project ideas and where they are. The idea being there's an embedded page where we can all go update what's happening with each of the projects in an attempt to create visibility. It's probably the stupidest way to do that, but it's, a, it, it's an attempt at the start of that. So what I want to do is like finish and publish the damn thing so that anybody else can jump in. It's a Google site, so anybody could edit it and improve it and, and sort of run with that. We have five minutes left because I'd like to end at the top of the hour to be completely uncharacteristic of OGM calls. Um, who would like to chime in on where we are, how you're feeling? Um, we, have, we did not step through the questions I put on the Google Doc, but many of you have con contributed tremendous things to it. So let's do that asynchronously between calls, and then we'll come back with that Google Doc at the next call. So I'll book a call for a Monday or Tuesday next week. Um, separate from our Thursday call. These, these are separate calls from the Thursday calls. We're, st we're still holding the Thursday calls. Uh, last sort of wrapping thoughts. And you don't have to say them in wrap. Oh, come on. Everybody's satisfied. <laughs> like this, this totally hit everybody's golden buzzer. <clears throat> It's Darren, much more on point than usual. Island, but, um, Mike, can you say that again? This is Mike. Uh, I've been very silent, been juggling a couple things, but um, this conversation is very, very similar to what I'm having with another group of visionaries. Almost exactly the same conversation is how do you combine the great insights and minds that are here? And I, I would argue that rather than trying to hit on one problem or one topic, maybe this group could provide guidelines and, and advice on how other groups like this could do something brilliant, particularly figure out how to go forward in the future on, on other projects, you know, just giving people sort of the meta. What, how do you think about the future? How do you think about having heart as was said so well and applying that to the big problems we face? That's, that's what we're trying to do at Carnegie. But uh, I have to say, I'm surrounded by people who see the world as a series of worst case scenarios. Even though international peace is our name, avoiding global catastrophe is sort of our, our theme. We're driving the truck toward the cliff right now, so yeah. Yeah, well, right before this, I was listening to the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which had an incredible talk. That sounds heartening. Well, <laughs> they're sort of... Uh, an allied group, but uh, um, Toby Ord, O-R-D, has just written The Precipice, which is a very daunting book about what could come. But I think somebody has to write the opposite. You know, what's the opposite of a catastrophe that, you know, a runaway success that, you know, solves half of our problems on a global basis? You know, what, how could we do that? And how could we help people think about that radical future, how could we get people to work together in mean, the most, and again, to keep out the, the naysayers or the, the people who just tell you about the obstacles. Or how to, or how to flip naysayers to being productive co-creators. Co Neil, then Charles, then we're out of the call. Thanks for that, Mike. I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but Buckminster Fuller's famous quote about turning weaponry into livingry and making the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time, given we have the technology and the capability to do that. Something like that as a vision statement for OGM uh, isn't impossible to imagine for me. And the question then is, at what level are we operating within that? Um, and so if you wanted to go for a big positive uh, step forward, Secondly, the final thing on, on, on your point is, how do we demonstrate to others how to do it if we can't do it ourselves yet? And so we've got to find principles and processes that work for us, even though we're very good uh, in these conversations, because we're not getting to action, because we're not deciding priorities, because we're not doing things or controversially challenging each other on these things, we can't really claim to be actually doing it yet. So I think we can apply ourselves to others, but we need to look internally first, which is why I've been suggesting some sort of meta constitutional framework for how we co-agree the rules simultaneously if necessary with projects that hit the ground. Uh, the diagram that I've put into the uh, thing is try to say, how do we get that toroidal effect feeding in from the roots, dropping down into things and feeding all of those that are in the trunk that are helping the flows. Um, to me, it's not impossible. And if this group can't do it, maybe it is. <laughs> Um...
I like that last note for some strange reason. Um, Charles? Uh, I'm probably said this here before um, or in this group, it's a phrase that came to me, I don't know, a few years ago, is get it, get it together to get together. Um, I want to thank Bill in particular for the tough love and maybe just um, on behalf of everyone ask for some compassion um, because a lot of us have been doing a lot and um, even getting together in, in, in smaller huddles and, and really doing a lot. Um, it's never enough, you know, so that's it. Um, I really appreciate that. And I thank you all. Uh, namaste. And I mean that from my, my mere understanding of the word. Um, and see y'all very shortly. We'll see you online, online. Go back to the document, fill it out. And uh, yeah, exactly. Keep working on the document. I'll set up another call like this. Thank you. Great call, people. Thank you.